Everybody, this is Three Questions with A.J. Giuliani. It is so good to talk to my buddy. You love the music, don't you? Yeah, just DJ George hey, in the house. I love that's it. right. DJ George. Hey, uh, do you know what? I didn't even, we've been talking for a while, but I, I wanted to wait. And I, I have to take out my headphones, but this is for you. Ah, yeah. At the Philadelphia 76ers. I know, I know that, you know, we have a history of the Sixers losing to the Raptors. Four bounces. Four, Four bounces. bounces, man. So I'm going to wear it. Nah, this doesn't look good. I'm going to take it off. <laughs> I got my, you know, Allen Iverson fat head still back in the day. Oh, that's right sweet. That's me. sweet. But, hey, that, I'm, real- I'm actually, hey, I, I hate to tell you, but, like, we're recording this, and what, the Bucks are playing the Sixers? No, yeah, not yet. I'm going for I'm going for Giannis, man. I, oh yeah, Bucks. Yeah, Giannis, man, all the time. Giannis, my guy. So hey, uh, if you don't know Ag Giuliani, he is one. He is just an incredible educator. He's a very good friend of mine. He's like a little brother to me, but a little brother that's way smarter. So I understand how my brother Alec feels all the time. But just uh, he, he's an incredible friend, incredible mentor. He's like family to me. Uh, and he actually wrote this book with John Spencer called Empower. And you can see, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see it on the screen. This book uh, is so beloved by people. And if you don't have a copy, and I'm trying to show you, it is, it's just, it's beautifully visually. And I know you didn't do that. That was John. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, like, <laughs> let's not, let's not pretend you did that part. That was totally yeah, John Spencer. That. Right. But uh, we got just a, a little kind of side story. Um, AJ asked me to write the forward for it. And, uh, I, I don't, I don't endorse books that I don't read. I don't, uh, write forwards for books I have never read. Cause I don't, I, I don't, I, and a little secret. A lot of people do actually do that. <laughs> right. So like, whatever. Anyways, that's something I'm very, uh, and I read it and I'm like, this is incredible. This is such a good book. And we had just started a publishing company, literally had no books. And I said, can you publish this with us? And they agreed to. And it's just been amazing. And people just love it. And like, can you talk a little bit about the book before we even get to the three questions? Yeah. So the book was the second book that John and I uh, wrote together. And so happy that George liked it and published loved it. it. Because, loved it. Um, you know, to me, that the book is all about, you know, not just making the case for students owning their learning mm-hmm. and having agency and all that kind of stuff, but what happens when they do like, what's, what's the mm-hmm. benefit. Um, and I think a lot of times we talk about research and all this kind of stuff, but it's really the benefit. So in it, we share uh, a lot of stories, uh, a lot of just different kind of step-by-step practical steps of how you can kind of make some shifts um, from compliance to engagement, to empowerment. And then ultimately you know, what does that look like in a classroom, in a school, and, and how do we kind of, you know, um, do that work? And the fun part about it is we wrote it really inspired by, by Austin Kleon's mm-hmm. book, Steal Like Artist, Show Your Work, where it's visually just exciting to read. Mm-hmm. And every other page, you're going to have something that kind of pops out. And, and John Spencer's fantastic, creative artist, really made it come to life that way. And, you know, we, we say all the time, you know, kind of is our manifesto, you know, what we believe in education. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's so unique to, um, books and education. It, I, I love it. I think that, so what, I can't remember what was the year this came out, 2018, 2017. Yeah, 18. So 2018, but, uh, pretty relevant the last little while. And there's, there's a quote and I always reference you, um, and it's basically, you know, we shouldn't have our, and you say this, right? This comes from you. Uh, we shouldn't, you know, what is the quote again? You know exactly what quote I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. We, we can't, uh, you know, focus all our time on preparing students for something. Yeah. Right. Our role is actually to help students prepare themselves for anything. Right. Here comes the pandemic. Right. You know, and yeah. all of us had to live it and breathe it and be a part of being prepared for something that we weren't ever going to be prepared for. Yeah. And I think that's that to me is like a message, not only for students, obviously, but educators, because you watch so many educators who adapted quickly, who figure things out. Uh, and I think sometimes 
we we can easily get into the space. I like when I first started teaching, uh, it was all about how engaging I was as a teacher, right? I, I, I tell a story often, right? Like I was so funny, just hilarious, such an easy person to listen to as a teacher. Kids could just say, they were like, I could listen to you all day. And they would do that little fake thing where they actually pretended they cared about my stories so that they could, you know, tell more so we don't have to do stuff. And just, and I always say that at that point in my career, I was a really good speaker, not necessarily a good teacher. Those are two different things, right? And I remember those same kids would go to class the next year and they're like, oh, Mr. Cross, we like miss you so much. Like this teacher like makes us do things and like we have to figure out stuff. And, you know, we're like, you know, having to learn I'm like, oh, oh, like what have I done? Right. And it's like, it's, it's basically the teacher had expectations that they would figure out. And that's, that was like a really big shift for me. And I think, you know, you watch uh, people that kind of excelled during this time were the ones who could figure out a pathway um, and it wasn't that they didn't lean on other people and it's not that, you know, uh, like that whole, no, like, I don't think that you have to say like, Hey, I don't want to be an engaging teacher. And I always talk about it as like a continuum, right? It's not an either or, but it's, you know, ultimately we want kids to leave school, not needing us. Right. Cause if they need us after they're in trouble. And I, I think that's a concern, not just in education, but you know, maybe a little bit in society too, in, in some ways. So, um, I want to make sure that we acknowledge John Spencer who did an incredible job with this book. Oh yeah. Give a little shout of horn, right? That's actually, Hey, I think that horn was the one that was played right when, right when Kawhi hit the shot to knock out the Sixers. I'm pretty sure that's what it was, right? That was, uh, this year, Sixers this year, fingers crossed. Maybe this was, uh, this was, uh, the sound uh, Joel and beat after. <laughs> he was crying. He was having. He's good, but I, lo- I love him beat. I, I do love him. So and I, I appreciate someone who loves the game so much that they get emotional about it too. Because you know how much I love basketball. Anyways, uh, three questions here. The first one, you know, and you have a lot of incredible stories. When you think of a teacher that really inspired you, AJ, and you've done incredible things, and I know that one of the things I appreciate is how many people you've inspired, including myself. Uh, and all the things that you, we always have these really great talks. You always like push my thinking every single time uh, we chat. Um, but when you look back, who's the teacher that inspired you and why? Yeah. So I, I think for me, um, there's a lot of teachers that come to mind, but there's one specifically a high school teacher, Mr. Flynn. I was not the best math student, um, was mm-hmm. more of like a talker, writer, that type of thing. And uh, he was teaching us, I think it was pre-calc at that time. Like it was high level math. And um, he blew out his back, Hmm. right? Like completely blew out his back. And we all felt so bad for him and everything. We show up and I kid you not, this dude is lying on the back table. (laughs) Seriously? (laughs) He had written out, he had written out everything up on the board and he was using like, uh, a yardstick, right? To, to kind of point to the different types of things. It was not engaging at all, right? right? It was just apparent that he cared about us uh, and he cared about what we were doing. That's not necessarily why I, I uh, say I remember him so much, though. It's probably one later, of the reasons, though. That would be yeah, that's one, a pretty memorable other, thing. Yeah, later on that year, um, you know, he came up to me. And again, I wasn't that strong of a math student, you know, probably flirting with a C or something like mm-hmm. that. And he came up to me and he goes, hey, you know, I really think you should take this computer programming class that I teach next year. It was like the first time a teacher had ever come up to me, Mm -hmm. shown interest in a potential of mine. And I had never done any computer classes other than typing like ASDF, JKL SEM, right? Mm -hmm. That was all I had done. And I remember thinking like, he's crazy. I'm like, is it all math stuff? He's like, no, I think you would like it. You're creative. Like you, you care about stuff like that. I'm like, all right. So I filled it out and I took it the next year and he taught it. And I'll tell you, I, I fell in love with what computers could do. Mm. And that's when I started just doing other things in computers other than writing or searching internet or that type of stuff, you know? And it was because he made, if he never made that comment, I would have never taken that class. I would have taken home ec for the sixth time just so I could cook and eat food and go on trips. But he made that comment and it really changed the trajectory of my life because he cared enough to say that to me. You think about those like life altering moments, right? When you have people say, Hey, you should do this or you should try that. Or have you ever thought about this? And then you kind of look back, you don't realize them in the moment, how much they're going to impact you 
moving forward. And I think it's interesting that you had a teacher do that because I swear I had teachers say, Hey, you should probably not take my class next year. Right. Right. I had the yeah. probably opposite. So there you go. So, uh, yeah. So maybe that, maybe that's why I do what I do. Maybe that's why I listen to you so much. Well, I just want, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Hey, um, you work with a ton of administrators. You, Obviously, a lot of people bring you in to do work with their school districts. You had uh, a plethora. Okay. Hey, can I ask you? I like to use the word plethora. Do you know why? I use, what movie is the word plethora? Do you know this movie? I want to see how, how like, if you know this. Anyone yeah. from my generation knows this. Yeah, what? Did you ever see the movie The Three Amigos? No. You've never seen The Three I like heard it referenced and everything, but I've never sat down and watched the three. Minutes. Yeah, no, it's he. They say the you, word. You've seen it a plethora of times, I assume. I have have seen it a plethora of times, and they use the word plethora. And this, the guy says, "Do you even know what a plethora means?" And I learned there's so much I've learned from TV and from movies like that. I hold to today. I also know. Uh, do you, did you watch Family Ties? Yes. I also know that scuba mean self-contained underwater breathing apparatus because Skippy was was studying with Alex P. Keaton. So I'm just saying, you know, TV, TV makes you smarter. Who can learn stuff? From stuff you know? <laughs> Anyways, uh, I know you've had a plethora of great administrators, uh, but when you think of like anyone, whether it's as a student, whether it was, uh, you know, as a colleague, who's someone that you really looked up to and why? Yeah, so um, probably maybe like my seventh or eighth year teaching, um, I was working at a really high performing uh, school district in Pennsylvania, Wissahickon High School. And we had always kind of been in like the top, you know, they do these rankings like in the top 50, like rank 47 or something like that. And um, every single year you had, you know, a superintendent telling you to innovate, Mm -hmm. but then talking about your scores, right? right? Um, So in comes this principal, uh, Miss Lynn Fields. She's fantastic. Was an elementary principal, middle school principal, high school secondary principal with us. She had worked in special education, just a lifelong educator. And um, I had worked with her before she actually had hired me and someone I really looked up to. But she started off and, you know, about high school Mm -hmm. teachers and staff like they're they're hard to work with in terms of like everybody's a content expert. Right. They know their stuff. School has been doing really well. It's hard to get people to change if they're saying, hey, like. Our, our students are doing well. The parents like what we're doing. Right. I get good reviews from my previous principals. Why would I change anything? And so she didn't come in trying to change things. She came in really highlighting things that were happening already mm-hmm. that were different. And the first week she was principal, uh, she sent out an email that was titled, We Believe, dot, dot, dot. And in that email, she just wrote all the things that she saw walking around the building and outside mm-hmm. everywhere. That was different. And a lot of the things were like people making mistakes, but she was celebrating them for like trying something different. Well, probably about the fifth week she did this, we're all like, oh my goodness, another We Believe email. Like for like me and my friends, your street cred was way down if you were in a We Believe email, right? Like way down, like, oh, the principal shouted you out, you you know, in a We Believe email. But by November, I remember the parent-teacher organization was doing a lunch for us and all the teachers were sitting down. And like people were actually talking about stuff that they heard from those mm-hmm. we believe in. Like, hey, you're doing a hydroponics thing. My kids would really love doing that. Like people right. were having conversations about learning and things that were happening. It was all because of her consistently every single week. She sent it out to all the staff, the entire administration, the superintendent, and the school board every single week. And I'll tell you what, by the end of that year, people were trying stuff and doing things that they never would have before because she had changed the culture just by showing what mattered and by sharing it. And uh, in three years' time, we are the number one ranked school in all of uh, Pennsylvania. And I, I honestly can say that much of it was attributed to her leadership and allowing people and supporting people and making time for people to do things a little bit differently. And like, so I, I'm always asked this question and is it, is it Lynn, Lynn field? You said Lynn fields. Yep. Lynn, Lynn fields. fields. And you know what? We're going to do Lynn fields. What you hated shout out. Now Lynn fields is going to be the talk. So, we believe. so 
what's interesting, people ask me because, you know, I'm like, uh, my blog used to be called The Principal of Change. And I actually ch- changed it because I was like, it's not just about changing, it's about growth. And, you know, and kind of, I didn't want to insinuate the sense that you're doing something wrong. Here's what to do right. And when I'm asked this question, and it's fascinating because I never, I've never heard this story, but it aligns with my advice I give to people all the time. People say to me, what's like, hey, you're going to a new school. Uh, you're the principal. What's the first thing you change? And I'd say nothing. The first thing I would do, get to know every staff member, know what their strength is, make sure they know what I, that I know what their strength is. Because if you go to places and people feel you're trying to fix them, they will fight you to the ends of the earth. If people know you have their back, you value them, and that you're trying to help them become better, they'll, they'll be with you. And that's like, what a perfect story uh, from your, your principal to do that. So the last question, and AJ, I'll, I'll say this about you. You probably are one of the, the quickest, I don't know if that's the right term, you learn quick. You pick up stuff, you're always trying new things. Um, and I got a good story about this that I'm gonna share You know, after you answer this question. Uh, just as an example of, of something that you do. But all that stuff that you learn, I know this is something you embody. If you go back to your first year of teaching, what advice would you give to yourself? I think um, it would be to give myself a little bit more grace. You know, I, I, as an individual, always have high expectations of myself. And I think I had two high expectations, probably like most of us coming mm-hmm. into our first year of teaching. And I made so many mistakes. I mean, I made so many mistakes. The biggest mistake I made was I started giving all of my kids these like um, tickets that were like for like extra credit that they could use at the end of the market right. period. Right. And at the end of the first market period, I thought it was a smashing success until I saw like a ticket deal going down in the hallway, <laughs> like some kid paying ten dollars for ten tickets. <laughs> so that he could use them to bump up his grade. I'm like, what have I done here? Right? Like I couldn't right. believe it. Right. Then I tried Smart. to take away the That's tickets. That's an entrepreneur <laughs> class right there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I tried to take away the tickets. It was mayhem. I had right. parents emailing me. My kids love these tickets. Why are you taking them away? I mean, it was a disaster my first year. And I would think it was just, you know, one simple thing. Just give yourself grace. Like try things. Don't feel like if you make a mistake that it's the end of the world because it felt like that year, every mistake I made Mm-hmm. It's kind of the end of the world, you know? Yeah. And like the, one of the things that, you know, I know that you always try stuff and you always do this and you know how much I love basketball and you and I have been friends for a long time. I don't know how much you know about my refing. Like I was really like a big ref. I was super into it, loved it. Um, but one of the things that they used to do when we'd ref is, and there's a reason I'm t- sharing the story is, uh, you would, you, someone would be watching you in the stands when you do college games and things like that. And then you have like a 10, 15 minute halftime. So short amount of time and the person watching, it will bring you in to that room and they were like, rip you apart. Really? Totally. Because they don't have time to like, they don't have time for the compliment sandwich. Right. They don't got time. We got 10 minutes. You got to go back out there. You can't say like, Hey, everyone just wait. We're like giving positive compliments to make this people feel good about themselves. Right. So what actually separated like great refs from everybody else is, um, basically, did you take that feedback and did you apply it in the second half? Like, did you go through that? And that's what actually separated people. And it it didn't mean that what that person said, because I remember like one time, I know this is going to sound ridiculous. It's like little things about refing. They'd say like, your, your run is a little funny. You got to try doing this. I'm like, okay. So, so like I had to like change my run because, because it's like presentation. And part of that too is if you have like a, a, a weird run, according to these refs, you bring, draw more attention to yourself and the worst thing to do as a referee is draw attention to yourself, right? The, the best referees are like the best principals. If they're great, nobody notices them, right? If they're terrible, everybody notices them, right? And that's kind of thing. So the reason I'm telling this story is because uh, I actually was keynoting a conference that you were also keynoting uh, the yeah. day after. And I uh, stayed just to watch you, uh, just to see you keynote. Partially uh, for me, to grow. Cause I, I like, I keynoted so many conferences, but I don't just leave if I can stay because I love watching speakers. I love watching speakers at the beginning of their career. And it's not like, 
I'm always there to coach them. I'm, I'm there to pick up stuff, pick up ideas. And I think, to be honest with you, I think that's what separates a lot of me from, because I'm always trying to get better, right? Um, but I do, you, I stayed and you're like, I'm like, do you want some advice on this? And you like, had, you had a crushing keynote, you got a standing ovation. And, and because we had a relationship, I didn't do no positive sandwich. I just went at you and I'm like, hey, awesome. this, 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 this. I broke down your keynote, went through everything. Yeah. And then you applied it the next day. And I'm sure that there's things that you said like, hey, he was right on this, this is great. Or like, hey, that's not for me. Do you know what I mean? And that's something that I think is, you know, uh, there is a really important aspect there too. The reason I didn't, you know, because you already knew you're great. You know, I know you're great because we've had such a good relationship for so many years. We didn't have to do that too. But I think part of that too is that you always want to get better. And that's something I really appreciate about you. And when you surround yourself with people like you, which I do, um, that want to get better, that know they can grow, that makes you want to do the same thing no matter where you're at. So that's what I appreciate about you. And I just wanted to share that because I, I, I just, I, that to me, when people take feedback and grow from it, that's something that I just look up to tremendously because uh, I know I've given feedback to people who've asked for it and don't listen to anything I say. I'm like, like why did I even waste my time, right? No, that, that 30 minutes to an hour that you were just breaking things down in a way that I wouldn't even think about mm-hmm. uh, was, was just like, it was like a master class in public speaking. <laughs> so I was like, I was like, should I be taking notes? Should I be paying attention <laughs> yeah, fully yeah. to what he's saying? Like, you know, like it was just kind of like that. And I think it's that it's that idea of, you know, if you want to improve and get better mm-hmm. you can't just do that by yourself, yeah. you need coaches, you need mentors, mm-hmm. you need colleagues, you need a whole kind of, you know, crew of people that are going to be there in all different kind of shapes and, and places. Mm-hmm. And you definitely provide that in many ways to me. That was just one example of you just, you know, boosting my confidence and at the same time helping me be better. Yeah. And I like right from the beginning of my career, that's something that I've, well, I've just want to get better at what I do. And I remember my, my intern teacher, I said, Hey, I would love to get this award. What do you need to see from me that you would think I'm, that I would be deserving? And you tell me what to do to get there. And I want to like, I might not agree with you on some stuff, but I'm willing to try. I'm willing to try. And that's something that, you know, I think is, you know, that's what I try to model because we ask kids to learn. We ask kids to try, like if kids walked into our classrooms and they knew everything, they don't need to be there. Right. And so, but I think we have to model that and you're just such an amazing model. Now, if you uh, don't know AJ, make sure you do connect with him. I'm sure you, everybody does that's watching this. Check out his book, Empower. Uh, he, they also did Launch, which, which is incredible. AJ, I don't even know. You have like 84 books or something like that. You're like the Katie Novak of not UDL. Yeah. So, yeah, you and Katie Novak basically are having a competition who can write the most books. Uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> keep going. Just, yeah, probably all those books behind you, if you're watching our YouTube, were written by you like in the last week. So anyways, AJ, thank you so much for being here. Uh, and everyone, thanks for listening. Make sure you connect with AJ. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks for having me. Take care, everybody.